This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Hello and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Sue McDougall and I'm so excited to be joining you, filling in for Trev. He's away again somewhere warmer, hopefully, um, for today. Looking forward to it. Now I'm so sorry about the technical issues and thanks for joining us. Thanks for being patient. Sometimes there are many things beyond our control, but we're sorted now. We have got a fantastic show we've put together for you this morning. Inspiration all about gardening. Gardening through winter, I must say, is one of my favourite times of the year we're heading into spring i know we're talking winter we are heading into spring so it's perfect time to get pruning and our friend greg will be joining us greg neighbor to talk about pruning now have you noticed how green your city is looking well trev's got an interview last week he had a chat to deputy lord mayor sandy angie talking about city of perth and the city's tree planting initiatives it's so exciting to see trees are now valued in urban areas more so than ever before and we need to get more in those urban areas so city of perth i know along with many other cities across the country are doing incredible things about the urban street tree initiative we'll find out what's happening in the city of perth and maybe it will make you think about what's happening in your local area also. And I'm so excited about Garden Express's offer this week. Now, we're discussing one of my favourite bulbs. Actually, many bulbs are my favourite, but Lilliams, there are something magical about Lilliams. They're just amazing. So we will tell you how to grow them, what to do, where you can get them some fantastic value. Um, as far as Lilliams go, and also I might just chat to, to Garden Express to see if we can find out what's happening with their hippie growing program because I know they've had fantastic success with that also. We've got five packets of Mr. Fothergill's seeds to give away. Now, stay listening because we can, we can all join in the show also and I'll tell you how you can get your hands on one of those packets of seeds a little bit later on in the show. Now, don't forget, Facebook Live is all about your questions and answers to your gardening queries. Maybe you've spent the weekend in the garden and something exciting is happening or you've got an area that um, maybe needs some help. But it's all about finding out, finding out what's happening in your area. Maybe that will relate to someone else's garden also. But don't forget to include your suburb and your state when you're asking your gardening question that makes my job much easier and also means that the information that you get is very relevant so we'll start off we're going to go pretty quick to get through these Cherie from Bunyip in Victoria South East Queensland looking gorgeous at the moment my indoor peace lily is producing green flowers instead of white it's been in the same spot for two years why would this be happening now does it need some power feed it's actually a little bit to do with the light um, you'll find that the flowers start off white and fade to green. So it's a bit to do with the light when it comes to indoor um, indoor spathophyllums or peace lilies. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt to give it some power feed, even some controlled release fertilizer at this time of the year also. Hope that helps. At least you've got flowers with nice warm position as well. Olive, I've got a tipicina plant I'm trying to grow. The leaves have fallen off. Is it going to die or is there something I can do? Tipachina is actually interesting, although it's, they get affected by the cold and the wet. So not knowing where you live, um, yes, they can drop some of their leaves, particularly the dwarf one tends to drop its leaves. If it's in a really soggy spot and it's a little bit waterlogged, keep it out of the water. If it's in a pot, lift it up, make sure it's free draining. They don't usually die, but over winter sometimes, so that slightly hairy foliage, they tend to look a little bit off. But you'll find it won't be long we are in the beginning in middle of july not long six weeks and we'll be into spring and it will shoot away but most important is to make sure it's not sitting in water and it's in a really warm spot so if you live in a cold spot move it around if it's in a pot 
to put it somewhere where it's quite warm for that beautiful winter sun. And so hopefully, don't forget, keep adding your questions while we're chatting. Um, see if we can find out and get through as many questions as possible. Lots of gardening advice happening here this morning on Garden Guru's Facebook Live. I'd like to introduce someone who's no stranger to us all, who's been part of Garden Guru's Live for a long time. Our next guest and a great friend, I know he's been part of it, Greg Neighbour from Love the Garden. Hi, Greg. Oh, good to chat to you. Now, today we are heading into spring. I see you've got a beautiful painting behind you. Um, the, the New South Wales National well, Floral Emblem, the Waratah, looking fantastic and probably ties in with our subject at the moment. Spring really is the get in and get things happening in the garden. Winter's so short, isn't it? Yeah. And there's a great sense of anticipation, isn't it? You know, what work you put in now, and you talk about promise, the work you put in now, you get rewarded in two or three months' time. So we are talking pruning today. Give us your tips. I know you've been gardening for many years. Give us your tips on pruning. Time to get stuck into the garden and really, I would say, give it a good clean up. Sorry, Greg, I think we've got a problem. We can't actually hear you at the moment. Another technical glitch. So we're just trying to, dis yeah, if you can disconnect, we can find out. We can get um, get your link up again. That would be fantastic. Sorry about that, Greg. Let's go while we're talking. Let's go to our question just while we get Greg back. Pruning is virtually the time of the year to get stuck into your roses and we'll get the best tips on how you can prune your roses. Caroline in Victoria, welcome to Garden Guru's Facebook Live, Carolyn. I've planted my daffy bulbs in a wine barrel and they've just started to flower but they're falling over. What can I do to prop them up? I actually find one of the best things you can do, Caroline, is just take a few branches. If you've got a few deciduous trees, a few finer twigs of deciduous trees, and you see this around in rainy climates everywhere, you put a few branches into the bulbs just around and that light branches that you've got, the deciduous branches that you've got, you prune off your fruit trees or your silver birch or anything you've got, just holds them up enough, particularly those fine branches, holds them up enough so that they don't fall over. They tend to fall over. One of the tips is to give them a little bit of high potassium or fertilizer that's got potassium in it and that helps strengthen those stems, which is very important also when you're growing bulbs to dandenongs good morning or good afternoon margaret what a good perennials to plant so that my spring summer garden will look spectacular well in the dandenongs you've got the most fantastic opportunity to plant some fantastic perennials one of my favorites and there's not just one variety in um, this whole range of plants there's many different varieties i'd be looking at Selvias. Now, there's incredible number of perennial selvias that will keep growing, keep flowering, and look fantastic for many, many months, right over summer, um, spring, summer, and autumn. So there's a great range of those around. If you can look for other um, pentstemons, another fantastic, the perennial pentstemon does brilliantly in a little bit few of the cooler climates. And some of the hardier, just the hardier native plants, some of the ground covers, scovolas would look brilliant and keep flowering right through summer. And while they're, they're classed as an evergreen ground cover shrub, they'll add some colour brilliantly right through, right through the spring, summer and autumn. I think you'll love them if you can put them in your garden. Keith from Moorbank in New South Wales. Are juniper berries poisonous? The birds seem to like them. There's a few tannins in them. They're not actually poisonous. Juniper berries are actually used to flavour um, gin. I know that's one of the things that they use. So they're not not poisonous, but we can um, definitely, definitely use them. So the birds do love them. And it's also interesting food source when there's nothing else around. Um, you can see junipers are used. I know 28 parrots eat, get stuck into my olive trees as well and cause a problem with my olive trees. Nicola in Melbourne, is there anything we can do 
in Melbourne to help with the powder mildew we're getting on everything. It's been damp for so long and I've pruned back and treated with no success. Well, powder mildew is actually a really interesting fungal problem that gets into the leaf, underneath the top layer of, of leaf. And you'll find that once it gets underneath that top layer of leaf, it little historia gets in there and you can get rid of the problem at the top, get rid of the symptoms, but actually the cause of it's not causing a problem. So thickening the cell wall with fertilizers that are going to build up resistance to disease for plants for disease is going to make a huge difference. Also milk is used as a mild fungicide. You can try milk as a mild um, fungicide. And also once you can spray regularly while it's dry, that's one of the things. And, and if you've got deciduous plants, or if you've got plants that have got leaves that are affected, pull those off and get rid of them. But maybe someone else who might be able to help us, I know we were talking about pruning um, with Greg Neighbour and we're talking about pruning. He also knows everything when it comes to technical stuff about fungal problems and diseases. Greg, welcome back. I hope we can hear you now. I oh, definitely can. Now we're just talking about powder and mildew. I know it's been a problem in Melbourne, been a problem in Perth also. It's keeping the plants nice and strong and healthy is one of the most important things, isn't it? Uh, now, Greg, I think we're going to, we still can't hear you in the stream. I can hear, I can hear you, unfortunately, but for our, for our um, viewers, um, Greg was talking about this huge amount of research going on about uh, building up good nutrition and how that's going to be the future of technology when it comes to keeping plants nice and healthy. So we might have to wait for that information, get our technical glitch out of the way, Greg. I'm sorry. In the meantime, we will talk other questions um, from from Dandenongs again, from Margaret. My peonies years old got pruned last year when I was ill. What can I do to bring it back to its glory? Now, years old peony, very jealous. Many people around the country are very jealous of that. Uh, unfortunately, it's just time. If you can feed it, keep the soil nice and healthy, and getting it growing nice and strong in your garden is just a matter of time. Looking after it, you'll find that the root system over summer will need a little bit of care. And if you can keep that mulched well, unfortunately, it's time feeding it with a organic fertilizer that's going to build up resistance to disease, help improve the soil at the same time and keep that plant healthy. And before long, your peony, Margaret, hopefully, fingers crossed, will be a blaze of glory of color like it was before. Now from Ken in Perth, I need some advice on what to do next. All my potted young edible ginger plants have decided to dry up. I could only be, see very small ginger rhizome underneath. Do I just leave them be in the pot? In Perth, we're having cold winters. Ginger grows brilliantly in warm, humid climates. So yes, it will die back. The plant will be dying back at the moment. Keep it on the drier side. And as soon as the weather warms up, Ken, you'll find that the plant will just bush up and start growing. And if they're potted up, you can repot them at that time also. Keep them a little bit damp, but not totally dry so that they dry out completely. Actually, ginger does brilliantly, aside from everything else, ginger does brilliantly in aquaponics also. Now, Greg, we're gonna try you again. Can't actually see him on my screen at the moment. He's disappeared. So unfortunately, let's head, instead of talking to Greg, let's head and talk to asparagus. My asparagus plants from Norel, this question is, keep those questions coming. We've got technical queries at the moment and, and problems. So if you can keep the questions coming, we'll just keep answering it. So my asparagus plant is slowly dying off for the winter. Where it's planted, the soil is really hard. Is it viable to dig up the bulbs, fix the soil and replant them? You know, incredibly, um, Norel asparagus are so hardy. They do fantastic. They're a long-term crop. Even in hard soil, they'll still keep growing. So their use of liquid organic soil improvers and soil conditioners helps improve the soil. Digging them up, they're actually a crown, not a bulb. 
So yes, you can dig them up, loosen the soil and get them growing and they do die back. At this time of the year, you cut all the fern off and then you mulch them really strongly or oh, thickly and ready for when they shoot away again when it comes to spring. So if you want to, you want to dig it up, loosen the soil, you can add organic matter to the soil, particularly if it's very heavy clay. But some of the asparagus crowns do grow in heavy clay and you'll find the use of a liquid soiling conditioner, a liquid soil improver will make a huge difference to help add microbial activity to that soil and loosen up and make the structure way more crumbly as well. Now we'll head to Victoria in Montrose. Hello Sue, my lemon and lime are fruiting. Lemons for the first time, well done. Every house I say should have a lemon tree. Lemons are small and shriveling up and the limes are turning yellow. Oh, not so good. They're in pots on deck. They get limited sunshine due to the trees location, due to trees on property. You'll find uh, if they are small and shriveling up, if they're tiny, um, you'll find are they in pots, small pots. If they're in small pots, put them in big pots. That's the thing. Citrus do need a decent sized pot. So if you've got a tree that's say a metre and a half high, 40 to 60 centimetres wide is ideal. And if they're shriveling up, make sure the water's soaking in, make sure there's no ants in the root system of the pot and there's not too many fruiting. If they're very small and they've just flowered and they're very small, sometimes it's to do with pollination also. If the limes are turning yellow, limes actually do turn yellow. They start off green and if they're not harvested before they're ripe, they do turn yellow. So if they're a decent size, at least a squash ball size, harvest them when they're green and just enjoy them because the more nutrients you give that tree, the more regular that fertilizing program happens, the better your tree limes will be and also the longer they will stay green. Now we might be working again. Greg, we were talking earlier about nutrition and powdery mildew. We might see if we can um, hear, everyone can hear you and pick up on that point. No, now I can't hear Greg. So it might be Greg Neighbour is, is part of all these things. This is what happens on live, live programs. It's just one of those things that we've just got to deal with. So thank you very much for being so patient, being part of our Facebook Live this morning. This is just, or I might say, live technology as it happens. I always blame the atmospheric pressure. There's a fair bit of rain around Perth at the moment. So let's blame that. What happens to technology is so good for the garden. I hope wherever you are um, part of joining us, wherever you live in Australia, you've had lots of rain and the season's looking fantastic. Now, here's a, we're going to try Greg again, or we're giving up. No, let's not. Sorry, Greg, we'll talk about powder and mildew later. Now, here's a question for any of you who are joining us who live in WA. When you last visited the Perth city, did you notice how green it was looking and what's actually happening? And now this is thanks to cities urban forest plan and I know this plan has won an award and last week Trevor had a chat with Deputy Lord Mayor Sandy Angie about this initiative. Let's take a look. One of the biggest challenges facing us as a community long term is keeping our cities green and many of the councils right across the country have done a great job with that but uh, there's a particular initiative I wanted to showcase today. It's so important for us to keep tree covers and canopies in around our cities and the reason is is that we're seeing this heat island effect superheating cities and making them hotter and hotter and, and probably less unpleasant or more unpleasant places to spend time with. So I thought I would invite the, Lord, or the Deputy Lord Mayor of the City of Perth, Sandy Angie, to join us. And Sandy, welcome to the show. Hi, Trevor, and thanks for having me. It's a, it's a really good thing with what's going on at the moment with the City of Perth. You guys have reviewed some of the work you've been doing because you've always been very good. Perth has a lot of beautiful parklands around the outside. But uh, you reviewed the streetscapes in particular and you've got this initiative um, where you're focusing planting a number of new tree species and, and some of the existing ones that work really well in places that probably weren't getting a focus before. Tell us a little bit about the scheme. Yes, yeah, so it's called the Urban Forest Plan. It was something initiated by the former council 
back in 2016. So one of the goals was to increase tree canopy within the public realm. And so this project had a 30 year time frame. So it's intended to go for a long time. However, what we saw when we came in as a new council, that there was really insufficient budget uh, to really make a dent into this tree planting program. So originally for this year, there was 200,000 earmarked to plant trees and we more than tripled this. So we added another 400,000 to bring the total budget to six $75,000 um, of tree planting. So, wow. you know, and then the other issue, yeah, so significantly different. And then the other issue is that since 2016, when the urban forest plan was published, there's actually been minimal tree planting in the CBD itself. It was kind of happening in the outskirts and what you would know as softscape areas, which are easier yep. to plant. And, you know, and then what, what I pointed out, well, hang on, you know, it's going to be hard to plant in hardscape this year, next year, or the year after. So let's just let's just do it now and increase the canopy in the city. So we've changed the focus now, and instead of primarily, you know, the quick wins in softscape, we're focusing yep. on getting more trees into the hardscape, into the centre of our CBD where it matters the most. Most cities tend to have green belts around the outside, and they tend to be the ones that that greenscape area that you're talking about that uh, are continually planted. But uh, this this is a big step. Because it's a lot harder planting, you know, streetscape because you're you're dealing with existing structures and foundations and services that are underground as well. So it does take more and cost more to do this. But this is obviously an investment that that you and council saw as very important for the future look of the city. Is that the plan? Well, that's right. So future look and also the health of the city and our residents. So as we try and increase the city's population, currently the population is around thirty thousand. We're looking to triple that by 2050 is the aim. And so, you know, that's, um, you know, we need to get as much green space into the city as possible. And, and just while I was waiting to chat to you, actually, I was reading some research that just came through in you know, the daily emails that we all get. And it yep. says that basically every little spot of green in our city helps. And so there's this new international study that's found that even roadside verges play a key role in the environment where there's these microbial communities that filter pollution and sequester CO2. So, you know, every bit of green that we can get into our city is really important. Absolutely. In fact, um, that, that research was a, was a fantastic body of research that suggested that uh, wherever there's parkland that's not cultivated as such, but just used, the microbial um, body, the, the, the mass of microbes that are in that particular soil is far greater by about 75% than cultivated areas. So whilst it's good to grow veggies and everything in our city, and we seem to have you know, places like City Farm or areas where people are growing veggies, et cetera, the microbial, the, the complexity of the microbial base in those areas is not as good as it is in straight out parklands and obviously street verges. So it, it's an important thing that I wanted to ask you about the tree varieties. I, I've actually had a bit of a read through and there's a few that you've trialed in, in some other places that uh, most of them seem to have origins um, or, originating from sort of northern Queensland. So they're sort of tropical rainforest trees, tuckaroo, macadamia, the Chinese pistachio, um, Australian teak, and also the Cape chestnut. These are beautiful ornamental trees. Have they proven to be pretty good in the, in the Perth environment? Yeah, look, I, I'm not a tree expert, but I was surprised, like you, to see the variety. And there's actually an interactive map on the city's Engage Perth website where you can actually look street by street what trees are there. And I think part of the plan with this diversification as well is that, you know, if a disease should take, catch on one variety, yep. that it's not going to decimate every tree across our city. So I think that's why there's a broad range of trees. And I think also, this, um, you know, the trees are being matched with what's been planted over time. So, mm -hmm. you know, various tree planting programs over the years have focused on different species. So we've we've got this broad range. And, and it's funny, you don't, I started paying more attention. So just driving down um, the stretch of Hay Street in West Perth, where my office is, it's actually all gum trees, which is mm -hmm. beautiful to see. And, you know, that's really uncommon to see gum trees in our city. And it's, you know, we don't even have it in our sub, have gum trees in our suburbs. So... I think that's you know great to see this diversity. I oh, look, I'd imagine the city of Perth has done a significant amount of your parks team. Uh, uh 
are well known nationally for the great work that they've done and they do a lot of research these trees would have been chosen for a reason and one of the things whether we like it or whether we don't like it is that when we build cities and we put buildings in and you know we create shade shade patches and we create all these we need to we need to be able to pick plants that are actually ideal for growing in that environment so sometimes they're not plants that would have originally grown in that area but uh, but adapting and making sure that we keep the area green by bringing in plants that will perform really well good example of that is probably the the main drive on Fraser Road up in Kings Park where you know we've basically got lemon scented gums which don't originate from from that particular region but they had tried many different plants and they just wouldn't grow in that environment and, and provide that stately effect. So they selected a, a plant species that actually grows really well in the gold fields um, to, to come into, into that area. So it, adaption and being able to, you know, when we modify an environment, identify what plant is best is one of those things that all your key horticulturalists there at the City of Perth would be working on all the time. What, yeah, with regards to actually to celebrate that more as well. We should, yeah. It's it look. It's diversity in its in its um, true extent. I, I I don't think we should ever apologise for bringing in different species and, and bringing diversity because I think it's a it's a wonderful thing. I, I was going to ask you, you. You mentioned it's a six hundred and seventy five thousand dollars spend. That's a it's a lot of money, a significant investment, and obviously a huge increase. But shows commitment of council to greening the city of Perth, and I think we're seeing this in leading councils right across the country. Tell me, how many trees are you forecasting will go in in the next sort of six or 12 months? Is there a number out there at this point in time? Yes, yeah, so I don't actually have the total number with me. I've got piles of, of papers here because I've got the um, original plan and not the, the numbers from the finalised plan, but mm. it is literally, um, you know, hundreds of trees. So I know I saw driving down, well, Hackett Drive, I think 42 have gone in the last few weeks again that's a soft scape area so it's easier to plant yeah. but you know it is hundreds of trees across our city but you know when you mentioned the cost before so I do have the costings here that I can share with you so hardscape environments it's actually 3,800 per tree versus soft scape 420 so it is expensive when you're digging up the road and yeah. you know you're obviously having to divert traffic and you're dealing with all the services and everything that happens underground in the city it is a costly thing to do, but a really important investment. And when you think of the things that the city spends money on, um, you know, temporary activations and things like that, this is something that is, is here for, for the lifetime of our city, for generations to come. So it's so well worth every dollar that we're spending, in my view. Absolutely. The, the trees that um, that you're, you're putting in, each of these trees can quite comfortably live anywhere between two and 500 years. So there's people who are gonna be visiting the city that see the work that the council has initiated now, um, you know, and it could be two or 300 years down the line where they're gonna be looking at these magnificent trees saying, wow, somebody must have really had the foresight and vision to think of what this would do for our environment and the, our enjoyment as, as occupants of the city in, well into the future. So I, look, I, I just wanted to bring you on board and and congratulate you and the, and the city of Perth on, on what is a, a, a great initiative and uh, encourage you to keep doing it and, and keep greening the city of Perth. And hopefully lots of other councils are tuning in, in and around the country, watching uh, what we've talked about today, looking at their plans and continuing to do the same thing for all these major cities. So we do reduce that heat sink. We do in, improve the environment people are living in. And of course, as you rightly pointed out, those trees take toxins out of the atmosphere they take carbon dioxide out they they store it as carbon in our ground and 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 um that's a that's a good thing for the environment long term thanks trevor now for your chance to win one in five packets of seeds all you need to do is tell us what ornamental tree is growing in your garden? Now, write it in the comment section. You've got one of five packets of seeds to plant in your garden. So join in, be part of the Garden Guru's Facebook Live this morning or this afternoon. And it ties in, that question actually ties in with my plant of the week. Now, this is absolutely my favorite ornamental tree. We always put it like this, but it actually grows like this. It's a weeping apricot and it flowers in July. You always think spring has sprung. These little pink rosebud type flowers, you can see it's inspirational. It comes, it drops its leaves early, beautiful gold tones, hangs this beautiful umbrella canopy that's stunning. 
and then there's nothing. Then July, always the 1st of July in my garden, it pops into full flower and it's like these cascading pink buds that come down. And then by the end of, by the middle of August, it's empty. There's nothing for a few weeks and then the leaves come. So have a look at it. See if you can plant it in your garden because it's one you don't see often, but definitely worth a position. One of my favourites, the colour is gorgeous. And when you see it on these beautiful winter sunny days, you think, gives you a little bit of hope that spring is certainly around the corner. Now, I know spring is around the corner when we're talking to Garden Express David Van Berkel because he's all about spring and bulbs and some exciting things happening. Talking lilliums this morning. Welcome, David. Hi, Sue. How are you going? Oh, so good. I just love this time of the year, I must say. I know I'm thinking of you. I hope I hope a lot of people on the East Coast are getting into their garden. They've got opportunity to plant this uh, beautiful collection you've got to tell us about this week. Yes, some beautiful lilies. I don't think many people will be gardening this week. It's uh, pretty cold and pretty wet for the whole week, I think. so. Um, but still, we can we can get out there as soon as the sun breaks again. Yeah, certainly. Now, lilies are a favourite. Do you think people um, have embraced them? They see them in pots and buy them as cut flowers or buy them in pots already growing. But do people realise how easy they are to grow? I don't think they do, Sue. I think we're ready for a resurgence on lilies. It's, um, you know, one of those, those old-fashioned favourites, I suppose, but they are so easy uh, all over the country. Uh, up north in Queensland, they just sort of keep growing and growing and the the flowers uh, repeat themselves year after year. So with a bit of fertiliser, um, these are bulbs that just can live for ages. Yeah, they certainly are. So you know when you buy a collection, I mean, you've got a fantastic office for us today and we'll talk about that in a little while. But you buy the bulb already. That Lilliums are different because they've got these little bud scales, but you're guaranteed of a flower, aren't you, the first year? Yeah, absolutely. Like if you pull each of the scales off, they will eventually grow and turn into you know, a complete bulb. But the, the size of the bulbs that we're selling are, of course, flowering size bulbs uh, and all of those scales sort of come together to surround that, that flower that's in there. So um, beautiful bulbs, beautiful value collections we've got for you today. Uh, and of course, lilies are quite a broad spectrum plant in the different styles that you can get. So you tell us about that, and we tend to bundle all lilies together, but they do vary so much. You've got the LA Hybrid Collection now, and also the Asiatic Pot Collection, depending what you want to use them for. Yeah, exactly. So the LA Hybrids are, um, they used to, the Asiatics are the, uh, are the old-fashioned sort of varieties that gives you that nice 90 centimetre stem. Um, and so the LA Hybrids are kind of a new cut flower breed of those old Asiatics. And they just give you this beautiful crown of, uh, of flowers on top of each stem, make it beautiful for picking. Uh, and as I said, to about 90 centimetres. Whereas the Asiatic pot lilies are a, a new uh, gardener's breed, I suppose, not for cut flowers, but for potting. They only grow to about 40 or 50 centimetres with that same kind of crown of flowers at the top. So a beautiful mass of colour off each bulb. So when we get them, when we grow them as cut flowers, do you think that um, just planting them together, what sort of conditions do they need if we were, say, growing them for cut flowers? And can I time a lilium almost to an event I was having? So, you know, imagine beautiful bunches of fresh, fresh grown cut flowers as lilliums. Um, is it easy to do when we're talking bulbs? Yeah, absolutely. Like lilies, they do love to be in a pot, but they also love uh, a garden bed situation. As long as it's free draining, uh, then during your winter months when it's dormant, you haven't got too much moisture around the bowl. But yeah, coming back year after year in the garden, spaced out a little bit, they're, they're quite vertical in the way that they grow, but the flower buds need to have, or the flower heads need to have a little bit of room. Oh, you're inspiring me. Now, also, I really wanted to talk to you about your growing conditions. You know, everyone wants to know where their crops come from, particularly when they're talking about food. And I think plants are no different. And I've got, on best advice, um, I saw just earlier, and I'd love for you to share it if you're possible, if you've got it to hand, the size of your hippies this year are fantastic. I've, I've got a great one here for you. Wow. The hippies, wow. almost the size of my uh, of my head. 
These are sort of, it's just about time. This is actually grown here in Victoria. Hippies prefer a warmer climate and will grow quicker uh, and, and to this large size in those warmer climates. But they do exceptionally well here as well. So we're uh, out in the Yarra Valley. We get the really cool winters uh, and still we're producing a bulb like this over two years. And it's interesting now because I know um, you grow your bulbs broad acre in, in a paddock rather than in pots and you've found fantastic success because cultural practices are forever changing when it comes to plant production, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Look, and, and for cut flowers, we probably would grow our hippie astrums inside a polytunnel, not maybe a glass house, but creating that warmth and getting the extra stem length. So in our fields, we tend to get a slightly shorter flower because of our cold climate and, and slightly shorter season. But of course, as you head up into New South Wales or across into South Australia, you get all these natural elements and warmths to, uh, to produce you know, a, a bigger and better bulb. And, and particularly a lot of babies can come off a hippie once it's left in the ground for a couple of seasons. Yeah, it certainly is. I think everyone wants to know that it's the real deal. The plants grow out in the paddock. You grow them. I know you have your hand in everything you grow. You're very much passionate about it. You've been doing it, I know, for as long as you can remember. Generations of um, gardeners in your family, part of Garden Express. Just tell us about the LA Hybrid offer and the Asiatic Pot, the Lilium collections, because they were $35.60 now only about $26, fantastic value. Yeah, so we've got a saving there of 25% on both of those collections. The LA Hybrid, you get 16 bulbs, and the Pot Lily is a little bit more expensive, you get nine bulbs for, for the value. Oh, David, every, every week you inspire me, and that's it, I'm going home to order some of those also, because I've had great success with Lilliams, and every time they pop up, I go, wow, well, and I'm so clever, and I've hardly done anything. So, and anyone who's joining us, get onto it, I'd recommend, go to Garden Express website, click on the Garden Guru's offer, is that right, David? Yep, correct, click on the Garden Guru's offer, uh, type in Lilliams, and they'll pop up, they'll be at top of screen. And, uh, and I agree with you, Lilliums are just one of those fantastic summer colour. And I did want to mention, it's about 15 weeks from when you plant them to when they flower. So you can actually put a little bit of timing into your summer flowering bulbs. Gladiolites are the same. Um, so if you want flowers on Christmas, you kind of work 15 weeks back from that general rule of thumb. I love that rule of thumb because, you know, you you might have an event or a New Year's Eve party or a Christmas party happening at your place, wedding, whatever's happening, a garden party to celebrate uh, summer. If you could put some colour in, then really you've nailed it, I think, David. Absolutely. And then you can also have a, a couple of planting times for your season, you know, starting some flowering in November, but also finishing all the way through to March or April, particularly with the, with the lilies. They've got quite a long flowering season. So, um, yeah, happy days. I uh, look forward to it. I hope to catch you next week. Maybe we'll talk about the Hippie Astrum catalogues. I know that's out and about. I am so impressed with the size of them. And I think there's a resurgence when it comes to Hippie Astrums as well. People get scared of them. Don't ever be scared of a Hippie Astrum. They are another bulb that's almost impossible to kill. But the Garden Guru's offer, sorry, the Garden Guru's Garden Express offer are Lilliums. Keep them out, look out for them. The LA Hybrid Collection, you've got 16 bulbs. They were $35.60. You've got a saving of 25%. And the Lilium Asiatic Pot Collection, you've got nine bulbs in that and there's a saving of 25% with those also. David, enjoy your day. Will do and love to talk hippies next week with you, Sue. I look forward to that very much. Let's head back to our question and answers. Don't forget to join in to win one of five packets of Mr. Fothergill's seeds. What ornamental tree have you got growing in your garden? Tell us in a little bit with my plant of the week, Weeping Apricot, which is one of my favourites at this time of the year. Let's head to Gidjigan up in WA. Is this the right time to prune fruit trees or wait to the start of spring? Peaches, plums and apple. Can you recommend someone who can teach me how to prune? Head, Claudia, head to your lo local garden centre and see if you can find someone who's local. There's lots of information around to your local garden centre. Be able to get someone can help you to prune. What time of the year to prune? Depends actually if you... Those varieties of plants, like the peaches and nectarines, that fruit on their new wood, it's better actually to give them a summer prune. If you prune them immediately after they've finished fruiting, then you send out beautiful new growth. That's the fruiting wood. Plums have a winter pruning. Yes, definitely this time of year. And apples, you prune 
for winter at this time of year. And don't forget a really good cover spray with a copper based spray to clear up any insects and any fungal issues you've got with your fruit trees. Heading down south to Collie in WA. Hi Kelly, is there any truth in only pruning roses every second year to get better blooms? Never heard that one, but it actually depends on the variety of roses. Some roses are spring flowering and only flower once a year. Some roses really need that beautiful new growth to come back. The reason we prune roses is to regenerate the plant. So you want to get beautiful long water shoots, really strengthen those plants and to get them nice and strong and healthy. So those water shoots are really strong and healthy. That's your flowering wood. So if you want to regenerate the plant, do it every year. I would always prune my roses every year as well. And I always say, just a tip, I always say for me, later the better because the later I prune them the less chance that the aphids have to find them maybe that has happened in your garden maybe it hasn't if it has put a note out um, join in the conversation put it into in the comment section because it's worth it less aphids in the garden the better from Ipswich in Queensland Scott what is the best position for growing veggies Scott veggies need as much sun as you can get so I often say at least six hours of sun a day if it's really hot over summer a light shade cloth helps a little bit a little bit of protection from that hot afternoon sun but you'll find you'll have the best veggies possible if you can give them five or six hours of sun I often find just a little bit of hail guard so a very light woven material is just enough if you're trying to grow veggies in a hot climate just to break them up and just keep them a little bit protected to them dandenongs what are some lovely trees i can plant for privacy oh so many margaret if you're going to plant some of that beautiful evergreen trees depending if you can get um, water to them some of the evergreen magnolias are just absolutely brilliant for privacy viburnums are brilliant you can plant uh, Choice here is another one. Maria might be a bit too cold where you are, but definitely choices and magnolias would be really good. Um, check those out. There's so many different cultivars you can plant. And then if you want to plant some some um, of the bushy native plants, Dodonia is another great one. That's a bushy shrub that does fantastic for screening. So depending what height you want, even deciduous plants sometimes are really good for screening because at least it's a thick foliage. Always when you're planting a hedge for screening and if you've got space, it's always a good, good idea to plant them on an angle. So you just alternate them. So you plant two rows and they're offset from each other. And that's a way you can get foliage all growing in together and looking absolutely fantastic in the garden. So keep your comments coming. We'd love to be part of, uh, for you to be part of Facebook Live. Don't forget you can join in with your comments what ornamental tree you're growing in your garden to win one of those five packets of Mr. Prodigal Seeds. And are you inspired by our offer of the week this week? Lilliums, I am. They do brilliantly in a pot. So beautiful, big, a little bit of an idea. Head to the garden centre, get a pot if you can, some premium potting mix and some bulbs and then put a few pansies or a few cascading petunias around the top. So while your lilliums are coming up to flower, you can enjoy some colour from your annuals that you've planted on the top layer, that's easy. From Barbara in Katani, close to my home where I grew up, is it true you're only meant to fertilize hippiastrums every month between April to August? Well, with hippiastrums actually, Barbara, they actually go dormant then. So you actually want to feed them over summer. Hippiastrums are interesting. And they flower before they put their foliage on. So you want them to have their dormant time at this time of the year. So they're ready to flower. So your fertilizing for your hippiastrums is happening over the summer months while they're actively growing. Now I have our winners for our Mr. Fothergill seeds. Lachlan will get them sorted for you. A bit stressed today, I think, Lachlan, but he's got a smile on his face now. He's done really well in um, times that have been a bit tricky. The technical guys, you actually realize how important um everyone is part of the team i'm the one that gets talked to you but there's a huge team behind us to get this event and thank you for joining in we appreciate it very much today's winners today kelly she's growing trident maple i agree they're absolutely amazing bob who's got an ornamental pair oh they're one of my favorites too bob the lime green foliage 
of my um, pyrus that are just stunning. And when it's in full flower, it looks like it's snowing. So I'd, I'd vote that one's beautiful as well. Jola Magnolia, yeah, another favourite. Leanne, all my trees, anyone who knows me, are my favourite. Japanese maples are absolutely stunning, gorgeous. And Barbara, I'd agree with you, the purple leaf plum. All of those up worthy winners i would say all of those um trees are just absolutely special if there's something that's inspired you to garden see if you can head to your local garden center i feel for you any who's part of our event this morning who are in lockdown i hope you get to enjoy your garden find a little bit of um, relaxation in your garden plants are all about having fun being inspired and just seeing things grow is something that's so gorgeous and maybe you've got some time to enjoy your garden keep the comments happening tell us what what you're doing in your garden this week it's a bit rainy here in perth um heard from david said it was a bit rainy on the east coast as well this time of the year out with the umbrella if you can get there spread a little bit of blood and bone around and then let the rain wash it in because anything gardening is all about the soil and if you can feed the soil that makes a difference to the health of your plants that's for sure and that's it for today's episode of the Garden Gurus Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, Lockie will send a message to the winners who have sent their um, trees, their favorite trees in, the winners of the packets of seeds, and they'll be coming your way very soon. Now, remember, you can always jump onto our website and catch up with our previous stories from the Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv or our YouTube channel, The Garden Gurus tv also and you can listen back to today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on spotify apple podcast and audible maybe you can do that while you're spending time in the garden with the umbrella and it's raining now i'll be back next week so make sure you tune in at 12 p.m australian eastern standard time happy gardening enjoy your day this show is brought to you by the garden gurus and evergreen garden care Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Visit the Garden Guru's online store and browse through a collection of high quality German made wolf garden tools. You'll also find a range of books with information to help create and maintain a beautiful garden. You can also access the online store on the Garden Guru's Facebook page.